I'm a managing director and partner uh, at Innosite. Uh, Innosite is a, uh, a boutique global innovation consultancy founded about 20 plus years ago by uh, the late great Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, um, who's best known for his work on the innovator's dilemma and introducing the world to the concept of disruptive technologies. Uh, from that genesis, uh, which got our firm started, uh, what we do is we work with some of the world's leading organizations um, on how to help them navigate disruptive change and own the future. Um, that can mean any number of things from setting strategy uh, at the enterprise level or the, even the business unit level um, to building capabilities inside those organizations to, to become more resilient, to be more responsive to changes in the marketplace um, and essentially building a capability to uh, sustainably, repeatedly take ideas to, to impact. Um, so I've been doing this personally for 16 years. I lead our financial services practice as well as our innovation capabilities practice. Um, and the topic on which I'm going to talk today, portfolio management, is one of a number of related topics that we think of as innovation capability building. So uh, that's that's hopefully uh, what, what you're all here for today and a little bit about my background and uh, what I do here. Oh, that's absolutely lovely. And I think uh, everybody here has a lot to gain. So uh, I've, I've been, you know, peddling this session to everybody who wants to listen. You know, people ask about, oh, no, how should we prioritize? And I just see responses like challenges, like sustained focus, killing projects, accessing company uh, functions, no clear objectives, all of that is related to something that Elizabeth is about to share. So Elizabeth, I think this is a perfect moment for you to kind of show those beautiful slides and start walking us through them. Show those beautiful slides. All right, um, good. In that case, let me go ahead and uh, not keep you waiting, Bruno. Uh, let me fire up my uh, screen share here. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, just to start is um, to put this idea of innovation portfolio management into context. Right. I mentioned a moment ago that portfolio management is one capability that we think of as a, a critical part of a broader innovation capability inside an organization. And what I'd love to do is just talk about that bigger picture of what do I mean when I say an innovation capability inside an organization? Uh, and the way I'd like to do that will hopefully uh, build on a lot of the things you've been hearing from everybody else over the last couple of days and just put it through sort of the inner sight lens for how we think about what that innovation capability looks like. What we often find uh, when inner sight talks with clients on topics of innovation is they describe to us different symptoms associated with some challenge they're having, right? A number of them have just appeared in the chat window. These could be things like, oh, uh, you know, we are struggling to prioritize. We are struggling to clearly articulate what, in fact, our innovation priorities are. Or we are struggling to kill zombie projects, was, uh, is what is always a favorite that pops up. And we think of these as symptoms um, to an underlying systemic issue inside an organization. And what many organizations do when they see these, um, these problems emerge is they, they play what I would describe as whack-a-mole with the, uh, the issue is they see the issue and they say, okay, let me fix that one issue. But all that really happens is you're pushing the problem such that it pops up somewhere else inside the organization because all these things are interconnected. Um, for example, you know, it's very common to see an organization say, oh, what we need is an innovation strategy. And so they create an innovation strategy. But if you look a, you know, a few years later, uh, the issue is not that they don't have a strategy, it's that they didn't have the ability to actually change the way resources were allocated to those strategic priorities, right? Or you might set up an innovation fund and put a governance committee around it to say, great, let's go tackle innovation resource allocation by that methodology. But then it's all too common to discover that, well, all you've done is you set up an additional piece of bureaucracy, which in theory had access to budget, but was actually overridden or stampeded by the ongoing annual budgeting process, which just has so much inertia associated with it. So what I'm doing is painting a picture of very logical steps that organizations take to tackle what appear to be uh, you know, uh, innovation challenges, but without failing first to recognize that all of these things are connected behind the scenes. And two of the most important parts uh, of any organization are what, the way in which an organization sets strategy, and the way in which an organization actually makes decisions to allocate resources. And so part of the in idea behind this innovation system is to recognize that every organization already has 
a system for innovation, whether it's informal or formal. There are ways in which priorities are set by leaders in public ways, in, through formal processes or informal priorities. There are ways, and I'm now moving to the top right of our little model here, in which ideas are identified, prioritized, again, formally or informally. Uh, there are tools and processes by which uh, these ideas are guided along pathways, informal or formal pathways inside an organization all the way through to scale. Similarly, there are ways in the bottom right here in all organizations by which portfolios of projects are managed. This might be the existing you know, budgeting process. It might be uh, you know, a business unit or a QBR review done with a CEO on a regular basis in which a, an aggregate set of projects underneath one person's control is reviewed to determine whether or not this is the right set of activities and you know, what changes need to be made. Um, and I could speak to the same about people. And, and the point I wanna make on this slide is simply to acknowledge that all of these things are interrelated and all of these things already exist in almost every successful organization that we've ever worked with. So the trick then is to acknowledge the systemic nature of these opportunities and think really carefully and holistically, which is if we're going to start to make changes to any one part of the system, you know, introducing a new way of describing our innovation priorities or adjusting the pathway by which an idea gets taken to impact, you cannot do that without full consideration of all other parts of the system to consider the follow on or the ripple implications of making those changes. So with that said, I'd like today to talk about portfolio management at the bottom right, but want to do so explicitly uh, by acknowledging that in order to manage a portfolio of projects, one first has to know to what end are you managing that portfolio of projects? You need a set of financial objectives, strategic objectives, or shall we say innovation priorities, a benchmark against which you can say, now let me manage this portfolio of projects to that end. Similarly, you need a well-developed set of innovation pathways, because if you're going to evaluate a portfolio and say, let me compare this late stage project with this early stage project, right? Is you, you've got to have some mechanism such as a stage gate process or something which allows you to compare different projects from different parts of the companies, which might be at different maturities uh, along some development path. And so the idea is that without that set of pathways, it's going to be hard for you to actually conduct that evaluation because you'll have no lang language or structure or framing by which you can actually categorize and therefore evaluate specific projects and portfolios. And similarly, as we talk about people, if leaders aren't empowered, incented to ask the right types of questions, it's going to be very, very hard to implement a portfolio management process where those same leaders are being asked to think holistically about whether or not the portfolio of things under their purview is actually going to deliver against the, you know, the long-term results or the, the, the other type of results. It, it's a very human challenge, all right? So there's a microcosm of all of this system embedded within portfolio management and just think that's such a critical place to start. But let's dive in then to portfolio management itself uh, as a discipline. In some ways, it's quite simple. Uh, we think portfolio management uh, of portfolio managers as the, uh, the discipline around asking three questions, right? If you have a portfolio of projects, you know, 100 different innovation projects or 6,000 or whatever the number is, depending on the size of the organization and the scope of the portfolio, you want to ask these three questions. Uh, and they'll sound somewhat simplistic, but they're very powerful. And so much of what happens in portfolio management goes wrong because one or more of these questions are missed by leaders. So question one is, are we doing the right things? Right. Uh, I'm working with a company right now um, that is really struggling to ask that question uh, in their portfolio reviews. They're very good at saying, do we have enough in the pipeline to hit this year's numbers? They're a little bit less good at saying, do we have enough in the pipeline to hit next year's numbers? But then they have all these other strategic objectives. Um, ESG goals, for example, uh, wellness goals. This is a CPG company. Um, what about strategic questions as to are they doing enough to take on certain competitors or certain markets? Um, whatever these criteria are, they should have an articulation that comes out of their innovation or enterprise strategy that says, these are the types of things we want to do more of. And until you can articulate that, it's going to be hard to answer the question, which is, well, now let's look at the pipeline. Are we doing the things that we said we wanted to do um, more of? So again, a simple question but I'm hopefully reinforcing for you that you've got to first tackle your priorities before you can answer the question, are we doing the right things? You've got to know what are the right things that you should be doing, which is a question of strategy. 
Question two, are we doing too much, too little, or exactly the right amount of stuff? Right. In most innovation portfolios, the answer tends to be we're not doing enough. That's typically why folks like Bruno or myself are engaged. It's to help add a little bit more to the pipeline. Um, but sometimes you could be doing too much. Um, and so you want to just pull back a little bit. There's no need to overly invest uh, in, in innovation if the, the, the level of change in the market doesn't require it. Or if your core business is sufficiently strong, then why would you need to rely upon innovation? Um, there's always a balance of which is what's the right amount of innovation um, or growth in your portfolio. Uh, and so this is what the second question is focused on. And then the third question, uh, equally important, is one uh, really of efficiency or optimization. Um, this same client I was just talking about uh, complained that, yes, they have 6,000 projects, but the reality is that only a few in each region are likely to actually move the needle on uh, business unit or region level growth, let alone enterprise growth. And so they've started thinking about the fact that they've got a lot of people, time and resources tied up in the complexity of managing a long tail of projects that might not make sense. Uh, each one, of course, is individually justifiable. Uh, you Maybe it's contributing a few hundred thousand dollars worth of additional value to the organization. But in aggregate, when you look at the complexity caused by all those different projects, it is a question worth asking of leaders, um, which is, what if we were to take out by number the bottom 30% of projects, how much would that free up in terms of resources uh, that could then be repurposed to refocus on some of these bigger opportunities to create even more value? Um, so this is a question of efficiency. Another relevant question in here might be, are we putting the most resources against the biggest opportunities? It's very easy to individually on a project level justify why 10 people are working on this opportunity. But then when you actually start to look at market sizes or the real opportunity from a revenue perspective, and you start to realize there's some imbalances in terms of you've got twice as many people working on something that's only two thirds the size. Well, what might, happen, what might happen if we were to do some load balancing here? So this is this third question of uh, resource allocation or optimization. And in some ways, that's it. That is the theory of portfolio management is how do you inside an organization, ensure that you know what the answers should be to these three questions for any portfolio you choose to manage. And then the, here's the hard part. How do you show whether or not your portfolio is actually delivering against the answers to these three questions? So that's, in theory, what portfolio management is. Let me um, talk now through four steps for how we typically think about establishing portfolio management inside an organization. First up, uh, you've got to define the portfolio of interest, right? That, uh, and I'll talk more about what that means. Number two, you've got to define to what end do you wish to manage this portfolio for growth, for EBIT reduction, for uh, ESG goals, because there, are, there isn't just one portfolio in an organization. There might be uh, if it's just the portfolio of all things, but it's actually not uncommon to find an innovation portfolio or a growth portfolio or the North American portfolio, or here's, all, here's a portfolio of all the things that we've got going on this year, which related to a digital transformation or whatever the case might be. So you've got to define the portfolio, what's in and out in order to manage it. Um, what, then, of course, you've got to know the performance goals that we've just touched on. Then step three is you've got to be able to create what we call the views. These are, simply put, the type of simplified synthesized data you're going to put in front of leaders that basically answer the question, are you doing enough or are you doing the right things? And then finally, you've actually got to use those data to make decisions. I can't tell you how many portfolio meeting, many meetings I've sat in where people look at the charts, they discuss them, and at the end of the day, no decisions are made. Uh, everyone is informed, and that's great, but nothing's going to happen as a result of portfolio management if clear decisions aren't made to actually reallocate resources, shut down projects. So we try to, to spend a lot of time thinking about what good decision making looks like in a portfolio management review meeting. Let me just touch on each of these four steps in turn more quickly. When you're defining your portfolio of interest, uh, I mentioned that there doesn't just have to be one portfolio in an organization. Uh, and many of you might be responsible in part for the innovation portfolio. Um, and that's fine. But you should just be very clear about what exactly is in and out of that portfolio um, and recognize that as a discipline, you can manage your innovation portfolio. You can also manage your portfolio of all things or all growth projects. Just being really, really clear about what is that portfolio um, uh, is a really important part. And I talk about the inclusion criteria. This is so that you know what's in and what's out. 
you know, example I have going on here is one of the more comprehensive answers to this question. So this is a global CPG firm that you all know and love based in Europe. Uh, they have a portfolio management review process uh, that runs every quarter in every region, uh, actually in multiple sub-regions within Europe. And so all these different areas uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis meet, and they review everything that is essentially contributing towards their expected P&L over the course of the next uh, 24 to 36 months. And um, they have some challenges with it, which is why we're here, because right now they tend to be financially focused uh, and they tend to be short-term focused. And their big ask of us has been, um, should we think about redefining which, uh, which projects we look at so that we're not wasting time looking at projects that are too small? And should we be asking different questions so that we can try to become more innovative over time and more long-term focused? And so the work we're doing there is goes beyond defining the portfolio into a number of other areas, but it starts with saying, okay, we, we understand that the portfolio you care about is that of everything, and we're going to try to move the needle towards those things that matter most. Uh, second step here would be clarifying the performance goals for these portfolio. Um, we tend to do this against the same three questions. So this is where you're saying, well, what does the ideal answer look like? If you're going to manage a portfolio for growth, well, how much growth do you need to get from your portfolio in order to deliver against enterprise growth objectives? Is there a share price target in mind? Is there an organic revenue growth target you need to hit? How does that differ by region? Um, the answers to these questions don't necessarily belong to an innovation team. They belong with an enterprise strategy team. But it's important that the innovation team can interrogate the enterprise strategy to determine what is it that you need from innovation. I think this is just a critical part because so often in innovation teams, there are fuzzy and undefined or ambiguous targets and innovation is seen as a nice to have. Whereas a core part, I think, of building a capability around innovation is to help leaders recognize that they should demand results from innovation. There should be a pull, not a push. And as such, it is a fair question to ask, which is how much growth or revenue or cost savings do you require that innovation delivers such that we can then resource appropriately and manage our pipeline appropriately to deliver whatever it is you need. If the answer to those questions is, we'll take whatever we can get uh, and whatever you're, you feel like you can deliver uh, and we don't want to rely upon you, um, my suggestion would be that you're probably in a very challenging place to be successful as an innovation team because it will always be hard to justify funding on a, an ambiguous target like that. Um, just to bring this to life for my uh, current uh, CPG client, you know what they want to do is build discipline uh, in the uh, sufficiency question uh, around, do we have enough in the pipeline two and three years out? They were actually great at showing that their pipeline was insufficient. And what would happen is leaders would simply look at that and then say, okay, uh, next agenda item. And, and, and we simply move on because they had no ability to act uh, on what to do it. Like, uh, they, they weren't quite sure what steps to take beyond say, well, I guess we'll need some more innovation, but we can't tackle that today. And so the idea of a time is to ensure that the portfolio management process brings that discipline. Uh, second one would be related to strategy. Are we doing the right types of projects? Uh, specific things that this current client wants to work on is they know they have ESG goals. They have wellness goals. So it's a food company that they want to do more with the products, you know, less sugar and so on, um, gluten free and so on. Um, and so they wanted to get really explicit, which is if we have goals like that uh, or other enterprise goals, how do we push that down into each of the regions? Like what are the specific targets, the measurable OKRs or KPIs against which we can manage a portfolio such that on a quarterly basis, we can say, are we doing enough projects that are going to move the needle against some of these corporate imperatives? Um, and then I think I'd already touched on this last one. The efficiency play was a big one for them. They were spending an awful lot of time on the long tail of innovation projects. Um, too incremental. And so a key part of portfolio management for them was saying, let's be really clear that we want to eliminate uh, you know, 30% by number of the projects in our pipeline um, and increase the average size of an innovation project in the pipeline. Um, so they, they're, we're going to be working with them to introduce some thresholds, which are a bit more aggressive than they have been in the past, and then figure out how to put the control mechanisms, the governance mechanisms in place such that those types of projects um, don't just continue to exist, but off the radar of a portfolio review. They shouldn't actually exist in the first place. Um, and so you need to give some teeth to the portfolio process. This is my favorite part of the, uh, the process because you kind of get into geeky charts. And uh, as Bruno knows, I think I have 10 pages of content here. I'm not planning on showing. 
which go into all these charts in great detail and talk about how different charts can be created to answer different questions. All I want to do for this group today is just illustrate the idea that for each of these questions, you know, are we doing the right type of innovation? Uh, are we doing too much or too little? Have we optimized? There are simple graphical ways in which you can answer that question at the level of a C-suite leader. You know, uh, if the question is, are we doing the right kinds of innovation? You should be able to articulate what the, you know, in this case, there's five different kinds of innovation or five different innovation priorities that this client had declared. And we're simply showing a sum by, you know, it could be revenue potential or it could be in-year investment, OPEX uh, or something else. But it's a mechanism that allows leaders to say, OK, we said we had five priorities. Gosh, it looks like we're investing heavily against two of them and we're kind of under on three of the others. So a really simple view in theory, uh, but a very powerful view that you can see how this would allow leaders to then say, oh, OK, this is an answer for that question. And there's a number of ways you could slice and dice it. You can see many, many variations on some of the slides I have here. Uh, and again, we could do the same. Uh, one of these charts in the, the middle here says, are we doing too much, too little, or the right amount of innovation? Um, and you can't quite read the details in a slide like this. Um, but one of the key takeaways on this slide was that they had lots and lots and lots of projects that were targeting small markets um, with small revenue opportunities. And so the leaders were saying, why should we just cut out all the projects that in the bottom two rows of this chart and instead go find some bigger opportunities to chase uh, toward the, the top of the chart, higher up the y-axis? So what you're trying to do is create these simple views. You're trying to take the focus away from individual projects and instead allow leaders in aggregate to evaluate whether or not that portfolio is actually going to deliver against what it needs to do over time. So I could talk for, for months on interesting and different ways of creating portfolio views. The, the one final comment I'll make on these is there are many barriers that stand in the way to creating views like this. Um, often there is simply a lack of a, a, a management information system to create the, the view. Sometimes this data is in the heads of people or it's tied up in Excel spreadsheets is uh, number one, I call that the sort of visibility challenge. Often there's a methodology challenge, which is you might be able to create a chart that shows you know, 20 projects and potential market sizes, but all you're doing is you're surfacing the fact that 20 different teams have calculated market sizes using wildly different methodologies. So you actually have to invest time in the discipline of not only creating the data, but making sure that across the entire organization, people are capturing that data via consistent methodologies. Um, and often what this exposes is the fact that there is no good pathway or consistent pathway. And again, I'm just tying this back to the idea that portfolio management rests on good priorities and good disciplined pathways. Otherwise, you end up with garbage in, garbage out in a portfolio management system, um, which is why you often tackle portfolio management alongside some of these other areas. Final step here, uh, perhaps the most obvious one is once you show these views, you can't just let leaders debate them. Anyone facilitating or designing portfolio management needs to say, OK, what are we going to stop doing, start doing or continue doing? And we find this just a really simple rubric to help get into the sort of the action mindset. Um, and, you know, when we're running or facilitating these types of conversations around prioritization, uh, we will have blank charts like this typically in a room. And we will work with people to say, OK, uh, <laughs> the easy one to do is what are you going to continue doing? Uh, what do we like? What's working? Uh, but the, the harder part is, OK, are there projects that we can stop because they're too small, they're inefficient, they're off target? And this, you know, the, those are the three reasons why you're going to find them, right? They're, they're not aligned, they're insufficient or they're suboptimal. Um, and then also, what are the types of things you might want to start doing? Do you need to kick off an initiative to generate additional ideas? Do you need to kick off an initiative to strengthen the methodology with which everybody uh, calculates certain things so that you can have more of an apples to apples comparison? Uh, again, we could go into a lot more detail for how you make uh, decisions with insights. And then this will be the, the last slide I think I use today before I, I pass up for, for Q&A and we can see where we want to take this. Um, the point I want to make here is it's very easy as consultants or innovation team owners to see an excuse to go create another committee, another process, and another structure. And to take an organization that's already working that has an innovation system and say, let's go create you know, a venture board. Let's create a portfolio management group. Let's go create some charts that they will look at. And here's the decision rights that we will give this new group. I, I would say that uh, 
over the first 10 years of consulting, one lesson I learned painfully over and over again is every single time we tried to create a, an, a, a new team, a new structure, a new committee, however large the organization was, um, it failed. Uh, it, it looked good. It would have productive meetings initially. But what you would tend to find happen is that that team uh, wasn't embedded into the standard operating model rhythm for the organization. Companies already have ways in which they set strategy. They already have ways in which budgets are set. And so our lesson learned these days, which is when we are now taking portfolio management as a discipline and saying, how do we embed this in the organization? Instead of creating new committees, now what we do is we look for the existing strategic planning process and the group that runs that. And more importantly, we look for the existing, call it the QBR process, quarterly business review process, whatever the mechanism is by which the senior most PL leaders run regular audits, strategic and financial of their business. And now what we do is we say, okay, surely those leaders want to be asking questions, which is, are we doing enough? <laughs> and so we meet that group where they are. And instead of creating a new committee, we work with those existing groups to say, um, can we help adjust your agenda? Uh, what are the questions you really want to ask but are struggling to ask? And then how do we start to adjust the way in which we gather data and present it to these groups so that they can make the decisions they've always wanted to make but struggled to make? And we've found that, that that is a way to make this sticky and to work, uh, which really means, and this is why we have the slide set up the way it is, we start with the existing structures and processes that actually control resource allocation and strategy, whatever they are, strap planning, budgeting, capital allocation. Then we say, what are the questions that you really should be asking in order to run a business thoughtfully for the long term, strategically? And then we say, how do we now bring in the relevant views which then empowers us to go say, how do we now create the data, create the visibility, bring the process such that we can embed the innovation capability in what you are already doing as an organization. So with that, Bruno, I'm going to stop. That, that was the you know, 20, 25 minute flyby for what is innovation portfolio management? How do we think about it? But uh, happy to get into it with Q&A, talk about any additional details. and Maybe you'll even give an excuse to get some of my favorite slides out. <laughs> Oh man, uh, so I almost got whiplash from all the nodding. <laughs> so it was, you know, it's great always like, hearing uh, from practice, but because a lot of people talking about this very, very important topic, in my experience, actually haven't done the thing, but do enjoy talking about it. So it's great hearing from, you know, firsthand experience, how things should work and what doesn't work. Like I sometimes appreciate more when people share what didn't work than actually what did work? Uh, I didn't even need to ask for questions. They're pouring in some very okay. hard hitting questions. So okay. uh, we will start. Uh, I'll start with the, with the first one. I have my answer, but you will be answering. So a question from uh, Ram that popped up while you were showing the, the visuals that are not supposed to be used as a wallpaper portfolios, but actually decision portfolios. Yep. So, uh, Ram is asking, do these views include both exploit and explore or sustaining business innovation pipeline? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So uh, the answer, uh, I'll give a two-part answer. The concept or the discipline of portfolio management is completely agnostic of whether you are explore versus exploit. Um, however, what you're, tend to, uh, what you're typically going to find is that depending on the organization, the portfolio that you want to review is likely to be one or other. It uh, doesn't have to be, but it's likely to be one or other. So uh, we did this project uh, a couple of years ago for a large uh, UK or Ireland, technically based financial services firm, a global firm, but headquartered in Ireland and, and London. And they already had, uh, so their business is a lot of um, software products, B2B and B2B2C software products um, in the sort of credit risk management space. And a huge part of their business was just exploit, right? Uh, call it 80% of revenue growth each year would come from growing their existing core business. What they wanted innovation portfolio management for was to bring discipline to the uh, the explore space. Uh, that was a space for them, as you can imagine, in software, um, where you know, for every ten ideas they might have, um, 
in the, we'll call it sort of the adjacent or more transformative disruptive space. So right out there in the, the further extremes of what you might think of as explore. Risk of failure is high. Um, constant need to test, iterate, shut down projects that aren't going to work. Um, and constant risks associated with things like zombie projects, projects that are being sponsored by executives that aren't going anywhere, projects that it turns out aren't actually going to deliver the willingness to pay that the company thought, uh, projects where it turns out the feature wasn't as compelling as they thought, or in a space where things are moving so quickly that competitors are jockeying for position. And so whatever you thought you might have as an innovation project might look wildly different three months later or once you actually hit you know, some form of um, test and learn, let alone production or scale. So for them, the biggest challenge was managing their explore portfolio um, because they felt that they were wasting a lot of time, effort, money, and expense um, chasing things and just had a lack of discipline around which things should they actually be doubling down on or advancing to later stages of um, their you know, test and learn and scale methodology. So I'd say that's where it works uh, and it works very well there. However, my current CPG client, you know, uh, think of it as you know chocolate and snacks and that type of stuff. You know, they're looking in Western Europe at you know ten brands they have, and they've got you know uh, eight hundred projects going on in Western Europe, ranging from you know we used to package this in a green package and now we're going to do it with a red package, or it's Halloween so we're going to change the color of the package a little bit differently, or we're going to take some sugar out as ingredients and we're going to add a gluten free version, and they'll have hundreds of projects that look just like that. Um, that's, well, for them, that, those are all counted as actually quite innovative, right? Now, we might say that's bread and butter. That seems like core innovation for many. But for them, core is simply growing the products they have. Anytime they're making changes to ingredients or packaging or branding, let alone channel, that's what they would consider an adjacency. And where they wanted to bring discipline was to that part of their portfolio, which is how do we, instead of having 200 projects to deliver you know, $150 million of incremental value, what if we could do that with 75 projects? You know, they also had initiatives like simplification, SKU simplification. We want to take 700 SKUs down to 300 by the end of next year. They needed a mechanism to essentially say, how do we manage all the stuff we have going on and ask the questions, are we doing enough? Could we, could we achieve the same value with less stuff? Um, how do we ensure we're making, pro making progress against our simplification goal and our ESG goal? And for them, portfolio management was a mechanism by which Whatever the portfolio is and whatever the goal, they need a regular drumbeat that allows them to basically ask the question, are we on track against whatever those ever-changing set of strategic investments are, strategic imperatives are? And I'd say that's far more of a, um, an explore use case where it's uh, bringing discipline to uh, managing the complexity inside any large organization that's associated with a large and complex ex exploit business. Hmm. So a long uh, answer, but it's, uh, I think it can be applied fit for purpose and it, you, you ask the relevant questions based on what it is you need to get done so i i see uh ram continuous asking and if i if i may offer uh i see this this is how i understood your answer and kind of i think this is a matter of technology like yep. uh one part is portfolio management is agnostic process regardless if it's exploit explore whatever you call them adjacent transformational disruptive etc it's one dimension in the portfolio yep. or one specific view that is kind of one part so therefore it uh when you were talking about innovation performance it is that the performance measure would be different for the dimension whatever typology is yeah is i'd encourage creating separate portfolios for explore and exploit each mm -hmm. one will have a different set of kpis or performance measures you're optimizing for um mm -hmm. usually the only time you see them all together is in the aggregate financial portfolio for the entire enterprise or yeah. BU, where the question is, you need to grow 12% next year. How much is coming from core or uh, exploit? How much is coming from non? Now, that's a helpful view to have to run a business because it allows you to say, do we need more from our core or more from our explore, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's relevant to have that question. However, once you start getting into the question, okay, now we know how much we need from explore, and we've got to manage that pipeline, you're going to be making different types of decisions to manage that portfolio. And so again, I, the, the, the simplistic answer is there's usually not one portfolio management meeting and review. There's a hierarchy of these things, the enterprise portfolio with its views, the explore portfolio with its views, and you're going to have a different team that's responsible for sort of overseeing and optimizing that portfolio to the mm -hmm. relevant goal. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that clarifies because especially when people don't work often with portfolios, they get stuck or it's just X, Y, but it's actually like you've shown in your three by three matrix. And it's, it is much more than that, or it can be much more than that. It is on a case by case basis. Yep. Uh, there are two questions that are connected. Uh, you did start answering them, but maybe you can continue. And it's uh, connected to actually when you were talking about garbage in, garbage out. Yes. So uh, l l let's take an example, like, or everything in portfolio compared to revenue potential. And you immediately yes. said, like, if you have uh, 6,000 or 25 projects and each one of them individually made an estimate, that sucks. You need to develop a discipline. So that's exactly what people are asking about. So it's very difficult to do so. Uh, what's your recommendation to improve the quality of this estimate? You know, yep. how to approach that? Uh, I have some of my experience, but I'd love to, you know, hear from you since people are I suspect we're, we're pretty aligned here. So I guess the first, from a principles perspective, I'd say is what you don't want is to be relitigating the quality of the data during a portfolio management discussion. If you have leaders saying, I don't believe that number, you, you've, you've already lost the battle. <laughs> so the purpose of the portfolio management meeting is to assume you've now got high quality data, apples to apples comparisons, and now you can actually get into to say, okay, this project or this project, which one are we cutting? Um, now, it's okay to have a little bit of discussion about that quality, but the whole point is the work has to be done before the portfolio management. So I, I might liken it to the iceberg as a classic here, is what you see in that portfolio management meeting is just the tip of the iceberg. It is the views that have been well prepared to answer the questions and you've designed the agenda for that meeting with the right people to go ahead and make the right decisions. And then the question we should ask is, okay, what needs to happen in advance of that, which might be months of work in order to have that meeting be high quality? So uh, I can give an example. Um, we, we did a project in Brazil a couple of years back where they said, rather than do, uh, they said, we'd like to develop a discipline of reviewing our portfolio once every quarter. But we've never done this before. So what we'd like to do is do a one-time portfolio analysis just to try this for the very first time. And that's the stepping stone towards saying, okay, now how do we do it again? To do this for the very first time, we went and said, okay, it's the Brazilian portfolio for innovation. So it's about 30 projects. So to do that, we had to interview every single project team leader and ask them uh, for a standard answers to about eight to 10 important questions. Like, who is your customer? What is the job to be done? At what stage in the pipeline process is this idea? What is your market size? You know, um, what do you think the payback period might be? What's the time? Like whatever you, whatever the relevant set of questions are that would allow you now to evaluate two different ideas. Like what's the strategic? Why is this project strategically interesting? Which does this hit digital banking or open banking? Does this defend against disruption? Does this help us take into a new market? These types of questions. Uh, now the very first time you do that, you get, you have lots of interesting discussions and you have really bad data. And then as you bring it all back together and you start to say, how did all these different teams answer these questions? For example, you know, why should we do this? And you start to realize that there are actually standard ways in which you could create categories for how to answer these questions. And you can start to develop a sense for, well, here's probably the rubric for how we should answer that question. You know, and the same for market sizing. You ask, well, how did you come up with that market sizing? Did you do it top down or did you do it bottom up? Did you do a price purchase penetration you know, frequency or did you do a willingness to pay times volume analysis? Um, and after you've done that with every one of those 25, 30 projects, you then go back and you say, OK, we're now going to answer the questions based on a, a, a common methodology. Uh, now that we understand deeply what each one of these 25 projects are, and we then took the data back to those teams and let them interview us and challenge us to say, well, you thought the market was higher. And then we started bringing other projects to teams to say, okay, well, look, here's your project, but here's another team's project. Um, how would you have done the market sizing? And essentially, we're cross-calibrating to create awareness and education for here's how one should answer these questions. And teams begun to realize, I see why this other team has a larger market size. Given how we made this assumption, it would be reasonable to assume that they have a larger market size. And essentially, we're doing a number of things that we're educating, we're developing publicly a standard shared methodology and creating buy-in towards it. And then over the course of about six weeks, which is what it took, we now felt like we had good data on these 25 projects. And we then sat down with a leadership team 
and uh, all of those projects is represented on a series of bubble charts and had a substantive conversation. But at that point, we could then defend any market size for any one of these projects. We could defend why anyone was larger or smaller than any other opportunity, why the answers to you know certain strategic questions made sense. But it's an effort, right? And that was just one market and 25 uh, you know, projects. Mm -hmm. But from there, we scaled it. Once we'd done it in Brazil, we said, okay, now we go repeat that in the UK. Uh, we went to the same methodology. And it was a lot faster because we started to know what types of questions to ask and what good answers would look like. And from there, we then developed a playbook that said, here is how, with worked examples, one should evaluate an early stage project and answer these types of questions. Uh, and over time, that started to ladder up now such that it's a methodology that gets repeated in you know, multiple regions around the globe and is scaled. But just to give you a flavor for sort of the, the legwork required to actually create high quality data is tied in with process and learning and education and buy-in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the way you describe it, it's definitely an iterative process yep. and kind of uh, to those that don't necessarily have access, uh, like people you and me, what I usually experience is CFO office and internal controllers are your best ally. Like people forget about, they think finance is a big blocker, but this is exactly where internal innovators and managers should leverage internal controllers, etc., to help them with that. And then another thing which you probably do to use range estimates instead of point estimates, which kind of come out in iteration. And the third thing that you did uh, demonstrate in, in your example is that it is an iterative process because this is where at least when people don't have external help, they get stuck. You know, we did the calculation once. It was very hurtful, very painful. It lasted for six months. Now this is the number. Why are you challenging that number? But it's not the sacred cow. So it, it needs to change depending on your learning. Yeah, it, it's, it's so tied in with what we call the pathways. So a lot of people, the pathway is the innovation process. Um, in a company where that's well established, there will be a standard iterative approach to doing things like you know, developing your business model canvas to developing the assumptions. And that iterative process will, in a, in a, in a well-run company, will have standardized tools, approaches, and methodologies for how one is supposed to do these things. Um, in some of the larger companies, you may find variations regionally and stuff, which can be challenging. Um, but it's portfolio management I often think of is built on the back of a robust uh, innovation process. Um, because mm -hmm. Uh, you have to assume that every project is working through that process and thus leveraging the methodology because that is what creates answers to the questions uh, that you're answering in portfolio management. And it's not uncommon for us to get brought in to do portfolio management. Um, uh, and this is why we like it. And then it turns out, well, people actually don't know the answer to the question, what are your innovation priorities? Oh, well, that's good. Now you work on a strategy engagement to set the innovation priorities. And then you discover that there is no methodology to evaluate market size. And it turns out they don't actually have a, a good or certainly a consistent methodology for doing the innovation process. So now you have to go fix that and, and work through that. And all in order that you can then return to portfolio management. Um, so although I think of it as a part of the innovation system, I actually sometimes think of portfolio management as the integrative discipline that sits on top of getting all the other things right. If you have an innovation strategy and you have an innovation process, portfolio management is the thing you can then do which basically says, is my process actually delivering against my strategy or not? Hmm. Absolutely. Alistair, we have only three minutes to go. And I have one question that really stands out to me. So okay. I'll drop it. And if you can answer it in two minutes. All right. <laughs> OK. So uh, Jennifer is wondering about uh, innovation investments connected to long term growth. Yep. In your approach, what would be the metrics you would propose to your client and what would, the, what would be the portfolio view you would propose to the client? Go. So can we just clarify the question first? So uh, the question is, because there's many ways to go, what things should we be investing in or what are the metrics we should use to determine whether or not we are appropriately investing in the for long-term growth? Uh, my interpretation is the later one. Okay. So... I think, so this is a sufficiency question, right? So if there's three questions, sufficiency alignment, this firstly, just to acknowledge this is a sufficiency question. Secondly, to acknowledge that long-term growth is almost always at the expense of short-term growth. Um, there's a trade-off. So typically what we like to do is when we are establishing the performance target for a portfolio, we like to be very, very clear about what this year's growth target is, what next year's growth target is, what the following year's growth target is, and so on. 
such that there is a over time set of staged targets. And those are typically going to be revenue targets or incremental revenue targets that you're managing towards. So with that said, I think we can now get to the question, which is, okay, how do you know if your portfolio is delivering the sufficiency? Um, I'd say there's no perfect answer. And the, per and the point of portfolio views is not to say here is the answer. The answer is to say here's three different views that inform our point of view on the answer. Number one, I would probably look at um, estimated steady state revenue. So it's going to be wrong, but you're going to take each project and you're going to say, based on what we think the market size is and a reasonable growth rate, you know, let's look out a year or so post launch, depending on the type of product it is, and then put a, a swag in there for what we think the revenue contribution could be at some point in time, uh, recognizing that um, you'll be wrong. And, uh, and then what we typically like to do is have some uh, probabilistic factor in there as well, right? So it's an expected value of that. Uh, and that allows you to perhaps weight it based on stage in the pipeline, or it could be uh, time into the future, but some ideally data informed perspective that you have based on historical projects which is look i know we're estimating 25 million revenue here but you know we we believe that with a one in five probability or two in five whatever the number is and then simply put i would say it's a sum total right so if you're trying to fill 100 million dollars of revenue two years out and you've got five projects in the pipeline and one says i think we can do 100 million with one in five probability and you know there's three in there that are doing it with one in ten probability you, you look at the math there and you're going to find your $50 million short. And mm. as a leadership team, the discussion you want to have is, are we comfortable in the probabilities? Is that $100 million high or is that could this actually be a $200 million revenue line? And get yourself comfortable with the fact that if you're lucky and the, the cook crumbles, maybe you'll hit that number. But in most scenarios, you're going to find yourself $50 million short. Therefore, you're going to want to add additional stuff to the pipeline to increase the sufficiency of what you have in the pipeline to deliver against that revenue number. And that's the simplistic way. I think it's very easy to get overly sophisticated and just lead yourself astray. So I like to go with really simple numbers. So sorry for interrupting, but this felt like a nice conclusion. So thank you. I know it was a challenging question, but I think you managed to deliver and it's good that this is recorded. So uh, people can go and, and really listen to what you packed in those three minutes because that was a lot, but all of it was actually important. Alice there, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this 50 minutes just disappeared. Uh, I'm happy that this has been recorded so everyone can go back, watch, access the materials. Everybody else, thank you for some great questions. Uh, please rewatch this, take notes. There's some really practical stuff here that you can implement immediately. Max, thank you for hosting and wish you all a great day. Thank you, Bruno. Take care, everyone. Good to see you all.